The silenced sound from minarets, cold mountain memories from the slopes of the Bugazan, the fertile soil of Pasha, praised by a poet from the north, the village of the Cape where fishing families sleep, and the fenced off fields of the Free State where once a family farmed. Poets from across South Africa speak about land lost and about the places they loved. I wrote the poem in the year after I got married and I moved away from the house where I'd been living for a very long time, for 28 years. Of course, I started to notice what was different about living in a new neighborhood. In the place I used to live, uh, there are actually three mosques whose sound you can hear uh, at the call for prayer. And so this poem was inspired by that sense of absence. But at the same time, uh, in speaking about uh, mosques and religion, I didn't want to make it sound as though uh, those issues are removed from history. You know, uh, religion is a part of one's full life. And if you're looking at mosques, you're also looking at politics, and you're looking at the relationships between people, you're looking at poverty, and, and those issues that don't go away because you're raising the issue of religion. So I, I wanted to write about the fact that many mosques are seen only as this isolated and somewhat alien presence, but they have a deep meaning in a community, a meaning of beauty and centeredness and spirituality. I hope that the sense of beauty comes through. I think that because of the way politics works in the contemporary world, maybe when people see a mosque, they have certain associations with it. And I want them to reflect on that. Well, what does a mosque signify? What does it mean to be able to enter a mosque rather than seeing it always on the outside? Why do people invest so much intensity, so much passion and hope and spiritual devotion in a building? I, I very much want to have that sense of those intrinsic meanings. But again, I don't want to take it out of the world as though it does not also connect with everything else that is important to us, how we feel towards each other, whether we have a sense of empathy and justice, and indeed, uh, all of those things, I think, are significant in looking also at mosques. Contemporary architecture. It rained. I left my shoes outside because there's no mat to permit a polite rasping of mud. There are places where you leave your shoes at the door. I watch the cat calibrate the distance between the man I love and me, find the exact midway point between us. In choosing where to lie, she practices a kind of architecture. A neighborhood practices architecture with sound, the sound of children, for instance, or a mosque. There are no sounds of mosques where I live. But if I drive for 42 minutes to the place I used to live, I will hear the calls of three mosques triangulate me, pinpoint 
my relation to God and home. Though you cannot tell from the homeless grief of young men's mothers, the architecture of mosques aims to create a space for love. When they look at Gatesville Mosque, a sight from the news, but to those who pray there, familiar as a cheekbone, most people will not see it is excessively lovely. To the outside eye, the blue-domed mosque marks a strange presence. To the hungry inside eye, its beauty grants a place in the world. One can read in bricks and light a numinous philosophy of proportion and repetition, a pattern based on the size of a single dot in relation to the height of the first letter of the Arabic alphabet can blossom into infinity. A mosque in Konya, Turkey, built in the 13th century, is known for its roof, a necklace of tiles suspended by breath. In its center is a hole that threads its patterns into the intricate sky. Where is the center and where the end point of its space? One day, while the prophet was praying, a cat settled on the warm bed of his robe and started to give birth. He did not move until she was done. Sifishin kungwini. Ebu sika sisambatin kubikipu. 
Sidikaya kuma kaya ngulube. Infu yoyo shanga luendaba. Ezi kobo no chani. Ekaya lisa kono skamdali. Ezi kona lwe. Lomi pefumulwana. Ekamli ngulule gulundwin. Tikanuka luma kunube. Ezi kamu za senji nezilwana. Tikumbula ma wale ngangas. Ezi chika zi pahum langum sindo. Ukutia kwa mechwe tu singa banduana. Nemi mangaswa yendalo. Imi tombo ne nchanjana. Ezi ngazani ne mbalela. Tinganelwe. Na manzazo. Tikaili mfuyo ne zilimo. Ezi nchaulelo kubalimi. Kumtaba wa mfuze mfuze. Kwa boba ulimayo. Tinga tinga pula pula. Ukumemeza kwe kalanga ingo cheni li singa li lambe li mluwe ashe ili fike mtini walu. Tibenga ya nga apanda buo nubu sobu ucha ama kamenta nga zamzu bunduana hae nga ziwa nga ziwa. Apo nda kwa kusakuba kwa makaya azo se kwa mili mite mite. Apo nda za ilwa kona kumumili kuli dama Nedi kinye yongi mbalingam. Danga ndi ngashasha amba. Koko babe ya kushle babati. Bindi ukale lupambeni. Daka ngela kulo nyotoi. Inemiza yetu yubunduan. Tifuni mpendulo. Yasuka ya ngocha. Koko igegayo. Ingabi mfene ne mbabala. Sasi futula sisi zingela. Sasi nukundi kumbula. Tazi vandi nganiwe. Kwa kimi tombo ya yumile. Inga ba mmache, imi tiye ngamu ni mingu nube. Ya isi na makama, sasa sibiza ngayu. Kwa u, kutandi munga, mshaba uwetu. Kwa atwa, inku mbulu za munga awe. Sinitala ugo mnata. I wrote the poem Signatures some years ago. It's not a typical poem of mine. I tend to write much sadder poems than this one. But I wrote it uh, as a response to my own local environment where I live, which is Cork Bay. As many people will know, it's a very beautiful, small village, slowly being invaded by rich people, in which I have to include myself, um, which will slowly change, I think, the environment. But it's been a fishing village for generations. It's a very comfortable, shabby town. We hope it doesn't get smart. And it's dominated by the fact that there are fishermen and, and fishermen's wives who actually control the environment. Um, everything you see is connected to fishing, quite apart from the fact that there are lots of little shops on the main road. Fishing is the main activity. Um, and it's a community that was not very disrupted by group areas and removals in the 70s, 60s, 70s and 80s, although I don't want to suggest it's a completely benign, mythic place, because of course there are huge differences of class, and the fishermen are battling reduced stocks, and they're also battling the whole, all the issues to do with quotas. So it's not an absolutely, completely mythical place to live in, but sometimes it feels like that. especially in the summer evening, um, when the boats are coming in, when people are walking to or from restaurants, and when the whole community, which is a very closely knit one, seems to be greeting each other on the streets. So I, I love living here, although my own imaginative landscape is, comes from mining towns, not from mountain and sea. Uh, but it's my environment, I love it. Um, and I wrote this one poem about Cork Bay. The poem's narrative, it traces in a very simple way a sequence of events that happen, um, including dogs peeing and people, baker, the baker walking down the street, the fishermen coming in on their boats. So it's a very, it's a very simply constructed. It ends with the, with the stars coming out on this deck above me um, and 
we get very clear star summer evenings. So it's, it's, it's just a very simple listing of things um, as a response to a kind of negative feeling about one's other life, one's working life. Uh, and it's basically about counting blessings. Signatures. And so, unexpectedly, after an irascible year, insomnia, low density bones, road rage, a torpid job, to this, counting blessings on a calm summer evening. From the balcony ledge, I see two fishing boats tilt in the bay, awash in ubiquitous snook and cobble the durable Hottentots Holland cradling them. And I think I hear the clack and clatter of cart, horse and wheel, a vulnerable sound, barely in memory, but it's just homing cars on cobbles. The neighbor's duck patrols the garden, checking its edible greens, smuggled in seed from Bellagio. Tim, the silent baker man, crumbs like confetti clinging to him, walks back from the Café Olympia, where everyone is happy and full. Lavender glazes the salted air, and even the yapping dog is quiet for a moment as it pees on the waxen Budlier hedge. One, two, three blessings, all the way to overcountable, as children used to say, still say, despite dot com, advanced maths, and astronomy's census of gyrating stars, stars now incandescing their signatures on the Duomo ceiling over my balcony choir. Kinapomelelo, <laughs> Il est serré dans sa tumisha, qui tumisha le filolé, qui vit du ngolona, à part la magadigue, qui tumisha mes sari, mes ditaba, batoba le filolé, banawa qui rejoint le bona, mazoro au qui fit le ngolona, et gama mazoro à baruti, si baruti, si radi baruti, boche boba, tiri le ngolona qui veut se qu'il le ressonne, car serré dans ses mouches de ngai le bois. Kiratahore so kinyakang le senyanya go ba so kinyakang gore le semetse le sekwe le sekushishi ke gore em gae e tla phela ele gae batho ba ikhantse ka gae go ba ne borutho ba batho ba ke go tseng le bona mo borutho ba le filo le ke go letseng go lona ga go tseo ka o netse go feta tseo ka ntle kwa le ba le nka re go batho ka re le lena boyang le tle le re tse mobu o o lefileng jona le bua le lena le tle le fe mobu o le thusheng le felo le gore le lona le gole le swane le mafelo a mangwe ke re le nna le mpushetseng gae le bua ke tswele pele go reta le go tumisha bohle ba o ba le gore ba dirile gore go bophelo ba ka bo be kaone le gore ge re le mo magaeng ga re bolae ke tlala ngwana ke ngwana wa batho ka moka ke se o ke kwelego ke kwa ke le sona ga ke be ke go la mo le filo le la ga phatla ka baka le o ke rata go le boga batho ba ga phatla ke rata go ba reta e bile ke rata gore ke a rata go ba mogae ke phomelelo ke mama mpi ke ngwatladi ke phomeletse go bomma mogasho ba baitsha go motho ya batho ke nna ngwana ngwa tua mangkhobele 
motho wa machika mmale thibana mabela se go bohloko ke nna motho ya bo a go soko soko di ben se se miriti me be di mongwa maloba ngwana go xi hlaba ni hlaba ka ngwe di le di ke nna motho wa mmaka di kwe ka di kwa ka di humulela ke tshaba metse go falala ke tshaba mediti sereto sa ka ke mpushetseng ga e le bo mpushetseng ga e le bo wa mo se le mo se a pesha go mashego a go tonya ka kobo ya borutho mo na ga e entswe go mpa e tseba go mokhoro tlala e le go lefamulele mo di khato tsa ka di a peshwa go makhura manga a ngala go palega mo masa a go teletsa go tshepo mahluku a laela a ikela nkisheng ga e le boa mo basadi ba tshwammare ba ne sha pula ya gore bana ba senyorwe mo bana ba tswang city tho ba betulela gore malapa a tle a sha mo le hutjo le sa tsebe go komelelo ditoro di nushetjwa go la go rotisha mare nkisheng ga e le boa mo thipana yeshu inkemeji Het was altijd ingewikkeld om een Afrikaans te schrijven. Want aan de ene kant was dit die taal van jouw tong en die taal van jouw ma. Die taal waarmee je die land leert kennen, waarmee je die grond verstaan hebt. Aan de andere kant was dit dan die taal van apartheid en die taal van die heersers en die taal van die apartheidspolitici. Zo so, mensen. Je hebt verschillende manieren proberen te zoeken hoe om met Afrikaans te werken. Dat hij, dat hij niet zijn integriteit verloren niet. Dat het niet lijkt alsof jij saam klink met die ander, maar saam dunk met die ander. Ik so, heb nog altijd mijn gedistanceer van waardeer gaan als zuiver Afrikaans. Ik wil nog nooit zuiver Afrikaans gebruiken. Grond is geschreven tussen 1990 en 1995. Dus so het was zeker eindelijk op die punt waar Zuid-Afrika zijn meest intense veranderings beleef het. Net na die vrijlating van Nelson Mandela en net voor die, die eerste democratische verkiezing. Dus so het was een tijd van geweldige onzekerheid. Vooral voor mensen wat grond het. Um, niemand het mooi gebied wat gaan woord van die grond. Maar ook op een persoonlijke vlak in, in, in mijn eigen leven, die grond waarop ik groot geworden het, is gekoop door mijn achter, achter opa groeitje. En hij sê toe hy die dag die, die plaats gekoop het bij die man, toen hij zoveel gouden ponden op, op die tafel gezet, dat die tafel gebreek het. So, is vir geslag, vir geslag, vir geslag, vir geslag, le my voorvaders begraven op die grond. Maar dan wordt het nou verdeel, dan wordt het weer verdeel tussen die kinders, dan wordt het weer zo. Ons het nou maar een klein stukje van die oorspronkelijke grootpaas het ek op groot geword. Maar mijn pa het niet te goed geboer nie, so ons het vreselijk skuld gehad. En toen mijn broers begin boer en hulle het, toe is die subsidies weggevat en die bescherming van die boeren is weggevat, so ons het al meer skuld gekry en die grond is, is is naderhand uitgezet om of verkoop te worden of verhuurd te worden. So de grond, die achtergrond daarvan was eindelijk mijn eigen bewustwording van dat grond wat ik altijd gedink het mijne is, altijd aanvaar het mijne is. Is dit niet meer niet? Maar het is niet net niet meer omdat mijn familie niet goed boer niet. Je raakt schielijk bewust, maar dit was dat nooit jouw grond. Je hebt maar niet gedunkt, het is jouw grond. Die grond is ook nog altijd aan ander geworden. Grond. Onder bevelen van mijn voorgeslachten was jij bezit. Had ik taal, kon ik schrijven, want jij was grond. Mijn grond. Maar mij wou jij nooit. 
hoe ik ook al strek om mij neer te lee in ruisende blauw bloekoms, een bees wat hoering zak en diep vlei, rimpelend drink die trillende keelvel, en taf zij tossels en leksels gom, en doornbome afgeglei naar die leegtes. Mij wou jij nooit, mij verdier kon jij nooit, Keer op keer schud jij mij af, rol jij mij uit. Grond, ik word langzaam naamloos in die mond. En nou word gevecht om jou. Beding, verdeel, verkamp, verkoop, versteel, verpand. Ik wil onder grond gaan met jou grond. Grond wat mij niet wil heen. Nie. Grond wat nooit aan mij behoort het nie. Grond wat ik vergeef ze als vroeger lief het.